I think I first met Sally, uh, Sally Cookson, the director, uh, last summer, uh, and we we sit down and she explained to me the kind of basic premise. Um, I think at that point in one of the studios downstairs, there was lots of big sheets of paper with all the kind of major plot points, kind of still kind of finding their place uh, in the script, but she kind of outlined this kind of basic premise of re-examining Dracula through the eyes of Mina, who is this main character who is somewhat sidelined in the book, despite being the kind of um, core kind of uh, database of information which ultimately brings Dracula down. Uh, putting her at the forefront, but also relocating all the action to Aberdeenshire, touching on some of the time that Bram Stoker spent there writing the novel and looking at how Doric and the kind of Northeast could play a part in retelling the story. From that point on, it really sort of first first steps were just casting the net as broadly as possible, so to speak, looking at every single reference, every single Dracula done before, um, as much as we could on uh, Slane's Castle, getting up there for a visit, um, looking at the coastlines of, of Aberdeenshire, um, looking at the fashions of the late 1890s, which we knew we were going to, we wanted to explore keeping it in that period. Um, but ultimately, kind of, it was it was a really broad uh, kind of initial research about everything to do with Dracula. To kind of get the ball rolling, I uh, did a very early design for the show, uh, just a really kind of kind of blue sky idea that was able to sit down with Sally with and say this is not necessarily fully developed or perfect, but it's a kind of a starting point. And that let us kind of have a starting point. We started to tear it up. We started to kind of build something new. But that kind of first initial design was just a good kind of starting point for trying to establish what the tone of the show was and what her initial instincts were of kind of how to stage it. Initially, that was that was drawings. That was all kind of full color renders. Um, a kind of a kind of pack of storyboards with kind of five scenes about how each one could kind of look and how the whole thing could evolve uh, but quite quickly uh, we moved into into 3d and we our, our next few meetings uh, we sat down with a, with a model box of hmt in aberdeen and uh, it started to tear up bits of card and piece them together and sell it them together and start to kind of actually get into the kind of nitty-gritty of what the what the 3d space is and thankfully we were also very lucky to have two developments in that time which we were able to have prototype um, scaffolding sets built for us in the space that also let us interrogate even more what we wanted this final space to work like. The whole process begins, I think, with the first sit-downs with Sally, with the director, um, at which point in this case we had very rough kind of um, headings almost for each scene. So that I had a kind of really great jumping off point of what locations we were going to visit. Um, from that point, I start sketching and researching. Uh, lots of very fast thumbnail sketches, things that wouldn't make sense to anybody else, um, but trying to get a sense of the shape of the thing in really broad strokes um, and trying to capture, again, this kind of first initial gut instinct that we wanted for the space, was, which was the sense of kind of impending doom and this kind of outer world kind of encroaching. From that point, I start modeling in 3D quite quickly. Uh, I use Vectorworks and start um, modeling in a, in a kind of 3D way on the computer, uh, which I enjoy because it means there's no waste. I'm able to quite quickly knock up a version of the space before I even start cutting card or cutting paper. And somewhere around the same time, I'm sitting down with Sally with bits of paper and tearing them up and putting them into a 3D model. So between that and this much more refined computer model, uh, hopefully able to begin to gather a lot of the details for the for the final set. Um, in there, there's also lots of research. I think in this, um, I tend to just have one big document on my laptop that I just drag every single image that I think could ever possibly be useful in there, um, mostly as a way to immerse myself in, in, the, in the period and all those details. Uh, I think in this, I ended up with about 200 kind of A4 sheets, uh, A3 sheets of images and research um, going all the way from the institutions at the time to Bram Stoker, to Emily Gerard, who influenced Bram Stoker. Um, and then that begins to influence a lot of the yeah, finer details on the set. Uh, and eventually I find myself at a point where I'm able to produce a final colour model, um, build a 1 to 25 version of uh, His Majesty's Theatre in Aberdeen, uh, and then fill it with, uh, with a final colour model, which in this case was a combination of 3D parts uh, representing the pre-existing bits of set from NTS 
and handmade pieces to kind of create the more custom bits that would bring it all together. And that's coloured, that's painted, uh, which is then used further down the line as a reference for the scenic artists in painting the final model, as well as for the carpenters and metal workers who, who will be building uh, the set pieces. And yeah, from then it's kind of much more detailed drawings. I do drawings, that, construction drawings that are focused more on the detail, uh, or more, more on the design detail. Whereas Cortland and Kleena and the production management team here at NTS take those and also do their own set of construction drawings that break them down into much more kind of bread and butter information for the makers. And then alongside all of that, uh, there's the research that's going into the costume. Uh, again, that begins from really loose sketches, um, looking at each of the characters, looking at who they're going to change into and what the major things that we can do to have them change character, but in the kind of swiftest, easiest way. A huge plus point of this process was how much development time we had with the cast. And so I was able to get a sense of, of their physicalities, of their body shapes, of their, like, what they were going to bring to the character and what the first instincts of the character were as well. So that set me off really well in producing a full set of colour renderings, which then go to wardrobe and able to be costed and things sourced from. And yeah, from there we then start gathering fabric samples. The really makers that we had building the masks were able to provide some prototypes and some samples of what those materials would, of what those masks would be made of, as well as the scenic artists did some samples for us of exactly what that kind of silvery finish uh, to the set and to the cliff tops would be. And yeah, and then eventually, before you know it, we're in the space, the set's built, we're adding lights and sound and projection, and we're able to start snagging finer details um, finalising things like masking to make sure we're not going into the, looking, the audience isn't looking into the wings um, and yeah, making sure it all comes together cohesively. In the sort of normal process of designing a set, a lot like architecture, you present a, a rough, uh, no colour, no detail, um, but accurate in 3D model. At NTS, there's a massive push to adhere to the Theatre Green Book and make sure that I think 70% of the set is either reused or is able to have a future life afterwards. So that initial uh, presentation with the model is also the point where we talk about what elements could be borrowed from previous sets, what elements could be made from materials that are renewable, and that's the point we try and tick all of our green boxes before I then make the final colour model at the final presentation. Here at NTS, I've got a brilliant um, head of stage, uh, Cortland, who uh, has a fantastic 3D printer. Uh, the, in, in the set we have these brass sconces, uh, which are really beautiful, and they're all custom 3D printed in order to hide all the wireless gubbins in them. But the other benefit was that we knew that we wanted the set to be as, as recycled and as green as possible, and NTS had a huge stock of sets from previous shows that we wanted to reuse. So for example, the, the kind of cliff shapes are kind of basic kind of theatre flattage, but are actually kind of a Frankenstein of lots of previous shows. And our metal gantry system is, is, is also a kind of patched together bits of James play and bits of Midsummer and bits of lots of other previous shows. So to help that process, um, we were able to 3D print all of NTS's um, set stock, uh, which made it very easy for me to take what we knew the shape, the shape of the set to be and incorporate all these existing pieces while retaining uh, the vision. So, um, that was amazing. We knew it was going to be Liz Kettle playing Dracula, who already is such a like incredible presence. And we knew with all costume design in the show that we didn't want to lose seeing the person uh, there. We didn't want to overcrowd them with too much stuff. Um, for example, the characters that, that kind of switch between male and female characters, uh, we didn't want to start putting facial hair on them or things like that. We didn't want to lose um, lose the performance there. Uh, and so we had some really great early days with Liz where she came in and uh, we got to play with fangs, we got to play with nails, we got to play with, um, we talked about contact lenses and we realised a lot of these kind of vampire iconic things are quite kind of close up um, features, things that work really well on film but don't necessarily translate on stage. Uh, which was good because we found that Liz couldn't talk as well in Fangs as she wanted to. And so that was a detail that we were quite happy to lose, um, especially if it meant relying on Lewis's projection or Aideen's lighting to kind of blow up some of those, uh, some of those moments. Something that I think was always in our minds because there's so much uh, gender swapping in the, in the, in the show uh, was exactly where Dracula would land kind of on that scale. Was, was Liz going to be playing it as a man? Was Liz going to be playing it as a woman? Or was Dracula this kind of ancient being where gender had kind of lost all meaning? And I think that's kind of where we 
where we found it. So what we did to Liz was, was fairly minimal in the end. Liz has amazing almost waist length hair that just is, is kind of wild and we wanted to keep that. But we ended up augmenting it with a small wig piece, which changed the shape of uh, Liz's hairline. Uh, and I think gave her a much more kind of severe look. Um, this fairly minimal makeup uh, in the final design. It's mostly about highlighting kind of the extremes of her features. And then the biggest thing is the kind of talons which Liz has, which are these um, lovely kind of 3D printed claws, uh, which catch the light painted into to kind of blend into uh, Liz's, Liz's skin tones. And then there's one kind of variation of those talons which lets Liz kind of open, open a vein during the show, blood drips out of her arm. The kind of image that we wanted to go for was Jack, the kind of opening a vein. Um, and so we went through several kind of ideas about how, how she might do that. Um, some of them were quite elaborate, kind of piping systems that she was maybe able to operate from under her arm or, or from off stage. But in the end, it was a really kind of lo-fi uh, solution. Um, she has a small pump uh, hidden in her palm, which has a pipe up to um, a copy of one of the talons. But if you look closely, they're really very different, but um, painted in, uh, you don't get to appreciate that from the audience. Um, and so Liz is able to uh, control the flow of blood herself, um, which I think makes it much more um, showproof. Uh, and so Liz is able to pump with her hand and kind of make this streak of what is actually um, chocolate syrup uh, down her arm for Danielle, who plays Mina, to then drink up. And the reason we use chocolate syrup is that it washes out the costumes really well, and from the distance on stage, you don't appreciate that it's brown rather than red. And beyond that, it was kind of about finding the costume and making sure that the costume supported her as much as possible. So there was a lot of back and forth. Um, how long could it be to give Liz the drama, but also how short does it have to be to make sure that she could scale all those kind of gantries and stairways. So we've hopefully found a good balance. We knew that the story was going to be set in 1890, as it is in the novel. Um, the novel was, pub was published in uh, 1897. So in my eyes, we had almost that kind of window to play in, kind of. Um, and also as much as we knew that we wanted it to be period because we were dealing with social issues of the time, we also didn't want to lose anyone under too much frill or dress or skirt or um, uh, anything that might be too restrictive. And also movement wise, we didn't want to restrict anyone. So there was a, a kind of balance to be found about making sure that the silhouettes and the shapes were recognisably Victorian, but not going to hinder the cast too much. Again, because the script and the plot were, were, were developing so much, uh, we knew that we had these characters in the asylum that were going to switch to become um, the male characters that, uh, from the original Dracula story. But we didn't know quite how or when those changes would be happening. So thankfully, all the, costume, all the costumes were designed to be able to be quick changeable from the get-go, which meant that as we progressed, we always knew, uh, regardless of what the structure of scenes might end up being, we knew uh, that we could get them in and out fairly quickly. Um, so we have the asylum in their kind of main, uh, almost kind of parchmenty uh, linen dresses. So our asylum costumes are kind of inspired by the fact that some of the asylums had proper uniforms, some of them didn't. Uh, and so the initial notion was that it was this idea that the women had also almost been given fabric to make their own um, outfits that incorporated some aspects of their backstories. Um, which was a great starting point. Morna had written backstories for each of the women about what their previous lives were, what their family situations were like, what their social status was. That formed some of the, some of the shapes and details on their asylum costumes. Initially, those quick changes were gonna be much quicker in that we were gonna retain the skirts and it was only gonna be the top half that changed with waistcoats and with hats to turn them into the male characters. Um, with the skirts remaining as kind of a reminder we're, that we're in a kind of memory world. But as we got closer and closer, we found that the, the kind of change in physicality that, that gives a performer between a skirt and trousers was far more uh, interesting and far more useful to them. So that was something that changed over the course of it. And again, I suppose the biggest uh, design challenge costume-wise was Dracula. We were going to have several outfits that showed Dracula kind of progress from a, a much more ragged, ancient, kind of medieval uh, baron when we meet him. In, um, in Castle Dracula to a much more svelte kind of Victorian gentleman when he lands in Cruden Bay to a kind of carnal bird inspired monster when he attacks Lucy. Ultimately, all those ideas kind of became one costume, which I think was far more useful in kind of defining Dracula's look. My favorite piece of costume is probably uh, 
is probably Dracula's Cloak, which was made uh, by a costume maker here in Glasgow. It's beautifully made, uh, and really every single aspect of it was looked at in so much detail, whether Dracula could open their, their sleeves properly to let blood, whether it had enough volume to kind of sweep about, but also not get tripped up in the front. There's little details, like it's got a kind of blood red lining, uh, as well as a kind of small red button uh, at the top, little kind of hints as to their kind of more carnal nature. Um, and it's got this lovely kind of almost leathery geometric pattern to it, which I really enjoy. The almost jumping point theme-wise was that we wanted this sense of this impending doom of there always kind of being something on the periphery, um, this danger. We wanted the set to have a tension between the natural world and the kind of more built institutional world of, of the asylum. And we also knew that a lot of these scenes moved so fluidly that we wanted to be able to go from asylum to Castle Dracula to Cliffs of Cruden Bay very uh, quickly and swiftly. Um, and we also knew that we had Lewis and Hertog able to augment the set with more images to help us with those scene changes. So the set became a kind of exploration of how do we make something that is this kind of climbing frame of possibilities for movement and for scaling. There's a lot in the original novel where Dracula climbs cliffs and climbs the walls of Castle Dracula. And so we felt like that was a good starting point in terms of what we felt the movement might be. Um, but again, it was finding a balance to making sure that it was skeletal and climbing frame-like, but also had enough surface for Lewis to cover and augment. So we landed with this kind of almost gunmetal metal structure which represented the represented the asylum and it kind of snakes in and out of these kind of abstracted cliff shapes which drew their inspiration from the kind of natural world the, the kind of cliffscapes uh, at Cruden Bay as well as the ruins of Slade's castle uh, the shapes of Castle Dracula again a lot of it was about finding a colour that is going to take the lighting well but also disappear if we wanted to go to moments of darkness so we developed this kind of silvery gunmetal texture which uh, actually links back into the Silver City quite, nice, quite nicely. I think the biggest thing that like audiences to take away from our version of Dracula, the thing that I think made the whole um, approach to it really interesting, is this idea of Mina's kind of ultimate temptation by Dracula and that 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 choice. Um, and I think setting it, keeping it in that uh, late 1890s time period focusing on the angle of it as her as a kind of feminist heroine and being trapped between a rock and a hard place between horrible kind of social conditions as a woman in, the t in, in that time and a life of kind of eternal darkness and vampirism and but also eternal life and being able to speak a thousand languages and travel across the world and fly and transform. Um, I, I, I hope I hope it makes audiences question quite maybe where they'd fall uh, on that on that offer should they get it from a uh, ancient vampire. <laughs>